hey, we're gonna talk about domain and range. Now, for some reason, when we first start looking at functions and we start looking at pictures of graphs, we start to get a little confused. We can get a little lost when we're talking about the values. Now, I think one of the main reasons for this is we often kind of get locked into thinking about X's and Y's. We always know that X's go there, Y's go there, and that's it. Well, there's a little more to it than that. Understand that when you were first taught about X's, you were probably told that the X value is the independent variable and the Y value is the dependent variable. Well, the reason for that is because when we think of things in terms of X and Y, well, imagine I have some equation y is equal to 2x plus 7, right? We're used to seeing things in terms of y is equal to some function of x or some equation with x in it. Well, it makes perfect sense that it's going to be easier for me to find points by plugging an x value in that I choose and figuring out what y is. In other words, if I put 1 in for that equation, I know 2 times 1 plus 7 is 9. So the point 1, 9 is on that graph. That's how we're taught to graph when we're starting out. Well, understand though, this doesn't have to be X and this doesn't have to be Y. You could be talking about the time it takes for you to travel somewhere. In other words, the distance could be here and the time could be there. So instead of a Y and X equation, you would have like a D is equal to 2T plus 7 equation, something like that. It means the exact same thing. So instead of thinking specifically of X and Y, I want to think of independent and dependent, or the way I like to think about them, function inputs and function outputs, or the value of the function. So in other words, this equation here, at a function input of 1, the value is 9. And that points on the equation, right? Because when I put 1 into the equation, the equation gives me back, or outputs at me, 9. So, how is that useful? Well, depending on whether I want to discuss inputs or outputs, I want to be able to separate them. That's what domain and range are. Domain talks about strictly inputs and range talks about strictly outputs or function values. So what does that do? What's that mean? Let's take a look at a couple of equations or a couple pictures and see what happens. Well, do you see this here is called a discrete graph, okay? What a discrete graph means is there's no connecting line between them. In other words, there's no points in between the points. So when I want to talk about domain, remember domain is all of the independent or all of the input values. We think of those as X values, right? That's kind of how we're, we're, we're wired to think of them when we start doing these graphs. So if this is our X axis, our inputs are on our X axis. So if you ever forget which one is which, domain and range, if you kind of get them messed up, Remember, domain starts with a D, range starts with an R. In alphabetical order, X, Y. D comes before R, X comes before Y. That's how I remembered how to do it when I was a kid. So if you're ever stuck and you forget, is domain this one or that one? Just remember, X comes before Y, D comes before R. So domain is X, range is Y. So when we're expressing these, what we're going to do is we're going to figure out essentially all of the inputs that exist on this graph. So you can visualize it in a couple different ways. The way I always visualized it was to just kind of imagine I took all of those points and compressed them down to the x-axis. So in other words, this point, let's use a different color. This point here, if I'm talking domain, comes down to here. This point comes down to here. This point comes down to here and so on until you end up getting all of the values that correspond to your inputs. And then we just write a list out of them. Oh, missed one way down here. So do you see then the domain of this is negative 11, negative 10, negative 9, negative 5, negative 4, negative 2, 3, 5, 9, and 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 15 is way out there. So the domain of this graph is all of those numbers independently. Now when we're doing discrete graphs or graphs that have just points, we have to use something called list notation. Now list notation is just that. You make a list of all the numbers. 
Now, we oftentimes will maybe put some notation in. You'll say domain is equal to, and then maybe you'll use these big fancy math braces that we usually don't figure out how to draw properly until we're in our 30s. Uh, and then you start, you just literally list all those numbers, negative 11, negative 10, negative 9, negative 5, negative 4, so on and so on and so on, negative 2, until we get to the end, and we're done. You close it up with those braces. You do the same thing for the range, but when we do the range now, I hope you can understand, instead of compressing our graph horizontally, we compress our graph vertically. So, I take all of those points and I squish them onto the y-axis. So this goes to there, this goes to there, so on and so on. For discrete graphs, this works quite well because it's easy to visualize just sliding the points over. Oops, sorry, missed that one. And both of these go to here. So now my list notation would start at negative 8. We always go from smallest value to largest. Negative 8, negative 3, negative 1, 3, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10. So our range, and we do the exact same thing, we'd say range is equal to we do our little brace and then we'd start down at negative eight, comma, negative three, negative one, so on and so on until we got up to 10, okay? So when we're doing discrete graphs, we have to use this notation. There's no kind of real other way to shortcut it. So that's finding domain and range. That's the way I always visualized it. When you start getting into continuous graphs, it gets a little goofier uh, to be able to compress the graphs visually. Some people struggle with it. So we'll talk about another way. A teacher I talked to a couple years back showed me the domain and range indicator. And he literally got up in front of class and made a fool of himself. And he said that your domain indicator is a stick that runs straight up and down. And you run your straight up and down stick that runs from infinity to negative infinity. It's the longest stick ever. And whenever that stick touches a point, it makes a noise. So I don't really want to make the noise, but he would stand in class and go beep, beep, beep. He'd yeah, it'd be ridiculous like that. So imagine that when you get to this point, well, you'd hear a noise. And it would happen just like that because there's only one point there. So that's great. So you know that negative 11 is part of your domain. You go to the next, oh, it would beep there again. So you negative 10 and so on and so on and so on. The horizontal infinite stick is your range finder. So in other words, you start at the bottom and you'd run it up and then, oh, touches right there. So you'd get a beep and it'd be at negative eight. So that's another way you can follow them as well. That helps when we get into things called continuous graphs. So continuous graphs are graphs that essentially have infinite numbers of points. There's a whole bunch of little points all along this line, right? And each one of them represents a solution to our equation. So now when I try and think about this in terms of compression, it might be a little trickier to see. Do you understand that every single point, essentially, would get compressed up to the axis, and every single point here, all the way to the end, would get compressed down to the axis? So you'd end up with a whole bunch of points in between here and here. Well, that means that our domain runs from negative 7 all the way to positive 9, right? If you use the domain finder, well, imagine that as soon as you hit this point at negative seven, your domain finder would start beeping and it would run, keep beeping continuously all the way until you got to nine and then it would stop. So you know your domain runs from negative seven to nine. Now, how do we express this? We express this in a couple different ways. The first one is called interval notation. Interval notation is really only useful for continuous graphs and you're gonna see it less and less the more you move on in math. You'll actually be using the set notation method far more. But for now, we're gonna talk interval notation. Now, interval notation is just essentially brackets with the start point and the end point. And it's assumed that all of the points in between are, va are valid answers. So what I would do is I'd write negative seven and I'd write nine with a comma. Now I'm gonna put brackets around them. Now there's two different types of brackets you use in interval notation. You use rounded brackets or square brackets. Rounded brackets are when the value is not included in your set, when the endpoint is not a part of your set. In other words, if this was an open circle point, 
that didn't include negative 7, I would use that round bracket. But because it is included in the set, I would use squares. So I would square bracket around 7 and 9, and that would be my domain. Right? So we do the exact same thing for range, except now we're compressing this way. So in other words, all of these points come to this axis all the way, like every single point. And then same thing on the other side, all of these points get compressed down to the axis, leaving us with that set of values there. In other words, negative 2 all the way up to positive 10. And again, using range finder, same thing. You'd start beeping when you hit negative 2, it would continuously beep because you're always touching a point. When you got to 10, it would stop beeping as soon as you pass 10. So our range now is going to be negative 2 all the way up to 10. Understand that both of those points are included because they're closed dots. You would start, you'd hear your beep as soon as you hit that negative 2. So I would have square brackets around those. That's interval notation. That works really, really well when you're dealing with continuous graphs like this. Now, set notation is a little different. We'll talk about that on this one. When we get to something like this, it gets a little crazier, right? Points are going everywhere. So if you don't have straight line graphs or pretty easy to see graphs, these are where things start getting a little weird. Now, don't worry too much. We're going to use the same technique, whether you like domain finder being this or being that, uh, range finder being that, or you like compressing your graph, however you see it. Understand, domain I'm compressing. So this point here, and every single, because this is a continuous graph, every single point gets dropped down to the x-axis. And you'll see that you keep getting points compressing down to the x-axis all the way till you get to here, right? If you use domain finder, it's gonna start beeping here and it's never gonna stop until you get to there. So when you do this, we know that our domain runs from we're starting at negative 13, and it's going all the way to positive 8. Now, were I using interval notation? Piece of cake. I just plop a couple square brackets around it, good to go. But we're going to use set notation, and I really want to break down what set notation is. So domain is, in this case, we're going to assume x values, because there's no value for the axis, so we'll pretend, we'll just say it's x. And we're going to start with our brace. Now it's really important that you follow all of these steps, right? Set notation, it's really strict in how you're supposed to write it. So first thing we have to do is we have to name the variable we're talking about. That's really important because if we don't know what variable we're talking about, it could be x, it could be y, it could be d, it could be l, who knows? So I'm going to put the variable that I'm talking about first. So this is reading as the set of x values and then we're going to use some math symbols. We're going to use a straight line. That straight line means such that. So it's the set of x values such that, and now here is gonna go kind of our condition. In other words, what's happening? Well, do you see I have an endpoint here at negative 13 and an endpoint here at positive eight. So I'm gonna be saying negative 13 to eight, but I can't just do it like this. I have to be a little more mathematical. So we need to use inequality statements. Now I know that x is greater than negative 13, but less than negative eight. So I can sandwich x right in between these and I can put those inequality signs. So I can say negative 13 is less than x, but x is also less than eight. So that's essentially sandwiching x in between negative 13 and eight, yeah? Now, this is really important. This here, the less than or equal to signs, are essentially like our square brackets for our interval notation. That means that the point's included because negative 13 is also a part of our set. Therefore, that equal to becomes really, really valuable and really necessary. Again, if this were an open circle point, that wouldn't be there. It would just be a less than, okay? So, all right, we still got more though because now we need to talk about what values are possible. So I'm gonna put a comma after our condition. Oops, terrible comma. So a comma after our condition, and now we have to say, well, what numbers can x be? So now a few more weird math symbols, and it's gonna be this thing. That means is a member of or belongs to 
or is an element of, in other words, it's just what kind of number is it? And you learned about number sets, like natural numbers, whole numbers, integers, real numbers, all that kind of stuff. So in this case, because every single possible point in between negative 13 and eight is part of our solution set for the domain, well, that means that our, that our values are all real numbers in between negative 13 and eight. It could be anything. So I would just put in the symbol for real numbers. And then I close my brace and I'm set. So that weird little interval notation thing, that's, uh, this, that's so super easy, becomes a little more complex. But when you get further along in math, this notation allows you to say a lot more with a lot less work. So this is the, this is the scenario you're gonna be using far more often. So that's our domain. Let's talk about our range. So our range, again, we're compressing to the y-axis. So I could also run my range finder up. I would hit negative seven, I'd start beeping, and it would beep all the way up until I got to here at positive eight, because this is the highest point. Right? So people often get confused and think that this is where the range ends as well. Remember, we're strictly talking about the y-axis. So when this all gets compressed, that point goes there, this point goes there. So that's the highest point in our range. So let's do our set notation for it. So our range values, brace, we're talking about the set of y values. We're talking about our vertical values. And such that, well, what's our statement? Our y values run from negative seven all the way up to positive eight. So negative seven to positive eight, and my y values are sandwiched in between them. So negative seven is definitely less than y, but y is at the same time less than eight. And again, because this is continuous, y belongs to the set of, or is a member of the set of, the real numbers. I close my bracket. All good, yeah, no problem. So if you think about domain and range as compression to the horizontal and vertical axis, or you imagine your domain and range finder, either way, you'll be able to see in continuous graphs a little easier. Now, the one last thing we gotta talk about is when is a function a function, and when is a function not a function. So functions are really, really important things in math. Functions mean that for every input, there's only one possible output. You can't have multiple outputs for the same thing or something stops being a function. So visually, the way we do that is we look at the vertical line test. So that same thing that's a domain finder will also determine if something is a function or not. And understand that for every single point, every single input, I can only have one output. So do you see that the vertical line test means that if I can touch multiple places on a vertical line, well, that means I have more than one output for the same input. For instance, if I talk about this input of negative two, well, I have a value here, I have a value here, here, and here. I actually have four different outputs for that one input. This can't be a function. In other words, the vertical line touches at four different places, even if it touches at two, that's not a function. So that's the way we determine whether a thing is a function or not. I look at something like this, Vertical line test again fails me because at this input here of negative seven, I get two outputs. I get the same thing happening at each of these intersections. So as long as I have multiple outputs or distinct outputs for one input, I lose that thing of being a function. This one here though is a function because no matter where my inputs go, I'm only getting one output. So if I imagine my input was here, I could follow that line up and I'm only gonna touch the graph at one place. That happens everywhere across this graph, therefore this is a function. So, hope that's helpful. Hope that helps differentiate a little bit between domain and range, how to figure them out, and how to figure out what functions are and how you can determine inputs and outputs. So hope that's useful, we'll talk soon.